best practices, set your targets, set a lot of them, collect your ground truth, test your stuff, you know, test, 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 check, check, check. This is really amazing stuff. It's fast, it's cheap, it's beautiful, right? It's like everything you want in your, you know, your first girlfriend. Fast, cheap, beautiful, right? It's just great. It's great stuff. Now you can't put it on. Your but it will also get you. It will also get you in a. Listen, the reason it gets you in trouble. The reason it gets you in trouble is it looks so good. It looks so good. Like you get it on your cat screen, it looks really, really good. You're like, the first time you see it, you're like, wow, wow. Like I never have to topo anything again. Wow. Right? Not true. It's not true. Okay, so those are my best practices. Um, I don't think it's happened yet. There will be a surveyor that will kill somebody with a car. It'll happen. It's probably going to be on the way. Yeah? What do you think about a five pound drone? Say 100 feet or 400 feet, that's still something that. Yeah, it could really hurt somebody, yeah. Because who's on the hook if somebody gets hurt? I am. But surveyors are stupid. Somebody's gonna, they're gonna kill somebody. Don't, like, here's what I tell myself. I do not want to go down in history as the first surveyor to kill somebody with a UAV. I do not want that to be me, yes. I don't know how much stock you put in TV commercials, but have you seen that armor insurance? No. Yeah, they got a drone that drone crashes the car. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'm surprised it hasn't already happened, I'll be honest. I'm really surprised that it happened. Yeah, it has, and they like, so they're going to do a new system now. They just came. They just came out in the last couple weeks on the news. The FAA is going to come out with a remote, uh, remote identification system. So you're going to have to radio tag your UAV, and like everybody's going to know who's flying that thing. And I, that's yeah, not true. that's not true. That's not true. Okay, go ahead. Currently under consideration, it may go into effect four years from now. Okay, so I should correct myself. There's some proposed legislation, yes. and I think it's a good thing. I, I think, yeah. We should probably know who's flying around that 10 pound UAV that could kill somebody. Yeah. Right? Okay, let's talk about the high practice for a minute. Okay? What do I want to say about that? It happens all It's going to happen more. It's going to happen more and more now. Because you can take this stuff out and fly it. So now, in a state like California, we have, we have some recourse because topographic surveying is covered under our LS Act. In my home state of Montana, that is not true. The only thing covered in Montana is boundary surveying. So, because it's illegal in California to fly UAV and provide mapping if you're not a land surveyor, that means nobody does it, right? Uh, happens all the time. We got to keep an eye out for this. When I was working for Adrian, I got a call from a company. It was a sand and gravel company in Fresno, and they said, "Hey, we're at, we're having a dispute with our uh, with our client." They've got, I don't know what, they had a name for it, I'm not a sand and gravel guy, he called it a conveyor scale. They've got a scale on the conveyor belt that weighs the amount of material, okay? And they had like a 30% discrepancy between what they said they put out and what the client said they got in the trucks. And I said, well, where's the other guy getting his numbers? And the, the client told me, we've never had this problem before with a client. This big of a discrepancy over the clients. I said, well, where's, where's the client getting their numbers? Where, does anybody want to guess where the client was getting their numbers? He said, all I know is two days ago, the client sent out a 19-year-old kid with a UAV, and he flew our quantity files. So immediately, a couple questions popped in my mind. So I asked, I asked the Sandra Gravel guy, I said, did he set any targets? He said, what do you mean, targets? I said, OK, check that one. I said. Did you see him? Did he have a survey instrument out at any time? What do you mean a survey instrument? Check. I said, hey, look, it's, it's four grand to have me come down there, set some targets, and fly and fly the piles. He said, all right. I said, I'll pay because I don't know. It was, it was a fifty thousand dollar material difference in the price of material. So I went down and flew it. We were within like ten cubic yards of this belt on the, the scale conveyor. What they call it, conveyor scale. Like, I was within 10 or 20 cubic yards. Like, it's essentially exactly the same. So what happened there? What do you think that client paid for that 19-year-old kid to run out there with his family? 
Yeah, I was going to say 500 bucks or 300 bucks. Now, listen, my my client had to pay four grand to have me go down there and do the job correctly, and so he was harmed because of what? Unlicensed practice, and that like that's not even that big of a deal as sand and gravel, right? Like this is going to happen all the time. There are really smart kids out there that can fly UAV and run the software. They have no clue how ground control works. This is no clue. And do they check anything? No way. So you know what I say? Hey, let those guys run them up. Because you know what I'm going to get called? I'm going to get called and fix it. I hope, I hope some people get burned. I do. Did the unlicensed person give them a volume? Gave them a volume. Yeah. Yeah. That was 30% different and told the client, don't pay your bill because these guys are cheating you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it was on license practice. So that I'm just that's the only story I have about that, but I'm sure other things. You guys run into this yet? Anybody run into unlicensed guys running UAVs? No? I'm waiting for a land title survey that like literally has a UAV ortho with no control and like the GIS parcel line work from some firm in Ohio or something. I'm like, I'm waiting. I'm waiting to see. It's gonna happen, you guys know what it is, right? Okay. I'm almost done. How does it change business? Here's the thing that's the most important to me about the UAV. It's, it's really, a lot in a lot of ways, it's not cheaper than conventional photogrammetry. Here's where it makes a difference for me in my practice. Right now, if I call my photogrammetrist and tell them I got a 30 acre site that I need to fly, how long is it gonna take them to get a plane up right now, do you think? Just guess. Two weeks, probably two weeks. Okay, after he runs the flight, how many weeks to get the aerial mapping in the ortho? Four weeks. Four weeks, probably. I just flew a job that was at the end of the runway in Stockton. I literally couldn't fly. So he flew it, and it was six weeks. Here's why the UAV is powerful. I get a client that calls me and says, Landon, I need an ortho ASAP. I can give him one in 48 hours. 48 hours. Now, that's just the ortho. That's no mapping. But I can give him a point cloud and an ortho in 48 hours. If he gives me 72 hours, I can give him an ortho, a point cloud, and a topo on a, on a 30 acre site. Now, I, now, I'm not in public practice anymore. If you're in public practice, you're like, man, I have But like, I'm in private practice, right? And like, what do you think land developers want from me? Yesterday. Everybody wants it yesterday, right? And so like, yeah, I can turn stuff around now in 24 to 72 hours that used to take six weeks. And you, know, you think I'm giving that stuff? Am I giving people the coupon deal on that? You call me and I turn it around in ortho and it's 20, 20, 48 hours to get the coupon deal? No, I'm, yeah, I charge people for that service. And we can do it. I, run, I got a party chief. I finally got a party chief to go take his pilot, sir. I couldn't get anybody to do it. I finally got a guy to go do it. That guy, I love him, right? Send him to the site. Sets the targets. He sets 10 targets and flies in 20 minutes. And at, in five hours, I've got a 15 acre, 15 acre ortho topo with good ground control. One guy. We run two man crews, but, right? It's awesome. So yeah, that changes the business a lot, right? I talked about how it changes land title surveys, changes land title surveys a lot. So it's a good thing. I, here's what it's gonna do, guys. It's gonna what it's going to do is it's, it's going to democratize photogrammetry, right? You used to need a $1 million plane and a half a million dollar camera. Now you need 2500 bucks, right? Of course, now I say that, but I've also been like, how much time and money have I spent slash wasted over the last six years? A lot, right? So there is an investment in time there, but the capital costs are very, very low, right? Which is why we're going to have this problem a lot. Because the capital costs are low. Like, look, even if you wanted to be a surveyor, what's it cost to get a total station? 20 grand to get a good one? 15? Like, how many 19 year old kids have 20 grand to drop on a total station? Like, how many 20 year old kids got 1200 bucks to buy a Phantom 4 Pro? Like, you can order that on Amazon, it'll be here tomorrow. So, that's going to be a really big problem. So, Pix4D runs more than. Pix4D, so you can get a subscription to Pix4D for 300 bucks a month. So 1200 bucks to three, and they let you turn it off and on. There's a toggle. It's like you use it in January, click it off for February, click it off for March. Yeah. 
So $1,200 drone and $300 a month, you can be in the mapping business if you want to be dangerous. And they'll sell you, guys, they've got these little tiles now that come with GPSM. You see them in the magazines? How good is that? Seriously. How good? How good? That ain't no good. It's no good. Now listen, it's okay. Plus or minus two feet, it might be all right. But it's not this good. And I probably wouldn't stand for sign it. Right? I'm not saying everything you have to do has to be this good. When we're doing stuff for proposals or conceptual design, we'll go fly with no ground control. You can process it and get a pretty good aerial. You just can't survey off of it. You know? But you can do just conceptual level scheming or uh, planning on that. So that works, that works pretty good. All right, any questions? I've been talking a lot. I'm going to go with Duncan first. Well, it's that 24 inch by 24 inch the size of your target and the layout of the target. I'm glad you brought that up. So we made some custom targets here, two foot by two foot. I wanted to talk about that. Just, this is a kind of a practical thing. You got to fly low. But what's the consequence of, so I like 150 to 200 feet. That's my preference. What's the problem with flying half as tall as you can fly by law? More, it takes longer, okay? But the reason I drew this, thank you, Duncan, was I wanted to tell you that 400 feet with your typical UAV, it is really hard to pick out the center of that two, by, two foot by two foot target. So you gotta think now, at 400 feet, are you getting 1500 horizontal if you can't make the center of a two foot by two foot target? No, now you drop, you drop from 400 feet to 100 feet, and you can pick the center of that target. So, here's what worries me a little bit. I had some, not a lot, but I had some background in photogrammetry, right? Like I took a photogrammetry course in college, and I worked with a photogrammetrist the first 10 years of my career. And like, he still picks up the phone and can call and ask him questions, right? If you don't understand what we just talked about, how the flying height affects your image resolution, and you think you're getting this, like, yeah, you gotta, you gotta understand these concepts, right? Like, you still have to, I'll be honest with you, now I'm, I'm starting to do a little more mission planning than I did before. Like before I just took the thing out of the box and fly it. Like we'll make it work, right? And like I'll tell you what happened to me, everything I, I, everything I flew the first year was in, in Stockton, like in the valley, and it's all flat at elevation zero. And so I did that, I just flew with no mission planning and for the first year it worked. And the first time I went into the mountains, I got burned and I'll tell you why real quick. So you're up in the mountains, and you're flying like this, okay, here's a little hill, that looks like a sharp end, but it's supposed to be a hill, okay? And down here, so you're 200 feet above, and let's just make math easy. Let's say you're 200 feet up, and you got a 200 foot footprint on the ground, that's your footprint, okay? Now guess what happens? Sorry, it wasn't quite that bad. Obviously, you can't drop scale. Okay, so you come up here, and now your drone's over here. What's your footprint now? It's not 200 feet. And so guess what happened to me? Everywhere around the hill, I didn't have enough overlap. Because my pilot didn't raise the drone and we were going over the hill and that footprint got small enough that I didn't get enough overlap. That was on the, that's the quarry job. That's what happened to me on the quarry job. I was fine in the pit. What happened is, is I didn't get enough overlap on, on the peak. <coughs> right? And like, <coughs> I processed it. I could get it to process. And like, I'm like, what happened? I got the oh, 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 it's like, oh, oh. right? Like, and look, if you use the mission planning software, like the mission, the mission planning software is like, I'll fly a grid, tell me how high. Is it gonna fix this? No. There's no, right now there's no way to factor in elevation, how the elevation changes your footprint on the ground in the mission planning system. It flies a dumb grid, that's what it does. Okay, here's the other thing too, I flew a job with a, with a, they were building some apartments and there was a big tower on it, big crane. You want to fly that with your automated grid? What's going to happen? You're going to hit that crane. So before you fly your grid, you got to make sure, you got to, on that job, like here's the apartments, there was a crane in the middle. Like you want to fly that with a grid, you got to break it into four pieces. The other thing a lot of people don't know is if you're flying that drone and it has any problems, it's got what's called the return to home function. So it sets a landing point. So what happens if you're flying it like this, this is your plane, you're gonna fly it like this, and you get over here and you have a problem with the drone, guess what's gonna happen? It does not follow the path back. 
you got to always make sure you don't have a vertical obstruction between your hull point and your UAV at any time. Because if you do, you can fly it. Yeah, if you can fly it high enough, yeah, right? You said to fly at 300 feet. Yep, if you can fly it high enough. So, anyways, a lot, a lot of stuff to think about, right? You keep saying fly path, but really, uh, you can sit down in the office and do a Google map so you can actually determine all of these problems before you go out and feel minus minus the things that have changed before you get to Google. So, so obviously your quarry, you can't fix that because that's probably something that's changed since Google flew. But the realities are, one, you're not doing traditional paths like, like a, a plane does, right? You're actually setting it up with a program that will fly a grid. Yep. So the realities are, your elevation and the tighter path really is what you're looking at, not more paths. You're just yep. tightening up. Tighter path, yep. Yep. Um, yeah. So it just listen. Right. Most of the time, it works great for me because I'm in stock. How do you fix the core? Yeah. The core, by the way, you, you fly it in sections so that you hit the lower elevation and you fly over. The yeah, plane. we had to do two flights at two different elevations, and I had to go back. I had to go back to the second flight and set more ground control. Yes, Steve. There is some software where you can load in a uh, like a profile. Yeah, you can get you know SRT and they did load it. Yeah, like a dim or something. Right, and have it fly the even two hundred feet. There you go. See, yeah. Um, but my question was, okay, you're using Pix 4D. How are you editing out the tops of the trees to create the topo? So I'm not. Yeah. So if it's under trees, you don't get it. You don't. You got to do it. Right, but it contours to the top of the tree. Oh, okay. So yeah. So we're not. So that's a good good question. So Steve's question is, how do you handle your Pix 4D running your surface? How do you how do you handle things like trees? Right? So my answer to Steve's question is you don't tin in Pix 4D. You extract points and break lines and you tin in your CAD software. That's the right way to do it. Okay? So if you've got a, if you got a guy that knows what he's doing, is he gonna take a spot elevation on the top of a tree? No, he's not. But now, so you can't just do that. You have to you have to go in and actually extract your points and lines. Right? Okay, everybody's tired. I'm done. Thank you for having me.